Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Johnson here uh, for another episode of Perpetual Chess with International Master David Proust. David, thank you for coming on the show. Hi Ben, uh, thanks for having me. Cool title. Oh, thank you. So for the listeners, we're just going to be honest. We just we just had a little snafu with the recording. Uh, an unnamed podcast co- host may have kicked his computer in the middle of the recording uh, and it had not yet saved. So apologies to David and thanks for being a good sport about this. If it's good, if it's good enough to do it once, might as well do it twice. Yeah, we were in the middle of a, a really nice conversation about the history of chess.com, which we'll get to. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about David's current life. So David lives in Berkeley. Uh, and as we had mentioned, David, tell, tell the listeners uh, your news of your new job that you'll be doing coming up. Yeah, I'm super excited to have just gotten a job as a sixth and seventh grade English teacher for next, uh, for next fall after spending this past year as a substitute teacher. Okay. And David, was this your, I, I know you've had, you've done chess teaching and work for chess.com. Other than teaching, have you had other jobs outside of chess? Uh, yes, plenty. Um, I've worked on a presidential campaign. Oh, wow. Um, I've worked, I've done management consulting. Oh, really? I've done high school English in China. I've written a book. Um, a chess book or different stuff no a novel oh wow I, I had no idea it's unpublished so okay I guess it's so, just sitting here on this computer okay well, may, well we'll keep an eye out for it so what was your uh, your favorite job outside of chess probably the high school teaching in, in China okay and how long were you there one semester and now you're going to be teaching middle school uh, could you tell our listeners what's what's your motivation for for uh, doing a job outside of chess for teaching because you also still do chess teaching, correct? Yeah, a little bit. Well, basically, I, I love teaching and I, I love helping people to become even better than they are, improve their skills, their habits, their knowledge, their wisdom and all that. And uh, with teaching chess, obviously, I was very satisfied to, to be giving uh, a bunch of life skills and techniques that I thought could stand people in good stead in their lives. But I was just getting to thinking that teaching, reading, writing, and sort of like, you know, the kind of like reasoning that goes along with those two activities uh, would just be so fundamental and even more helpful perhaps as a way to improve the powers of, of the youth and thus the quality of people in the next generation. Nice. And uh, what's the, uh, what type of school will you be teaching at? Um, it's a, um, private bilingual English French school. Okay. Um, in Berkeley. Oh, and you live in Berkeley. I think we mentioned. And I, yeah. Um, so do you have any say in designing the curriculum or is it, uh, pretty much laid out for you? They have a, they have a pretty set curriculum and, um, I'll be happy to follow that, but I will also, make some suggestions here and there and see if uh, see if they'd like me to incorporate some of my ideas and content. Nice. And how are your uh, your classroom management skills? Improving. <laughs> Improving. As a substitute, I think you get like the worst of it because when you walk in for the first time, they think, oh, all the rules are off and we're never going to have to see this person again so we can treat them with like utter disrespect and, uh, you know, there will be no consequence because we won't have to see them tomorrow. And uh, so it was a little bit more challenging than I thought it would be at first since, I, you know, I'd taught in, in China before in very large classrooms, 55 to 60 students per class. So, you know, I thought my classroom management was fine. And then there were some added challenges. <laughs> wow. As a substitute. Yeah, I mean... But, I- I think we can all remember being as students that feeling of uh, giddiness when a substitute walks in. So, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I've been on the other side of that. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely um, it's a rite of passage to <laughs> to go from being the the kid that's excited to the adult that's like, oh my goodness, here we go. So, yeah. do you what what have you picked up? How do you control those wild young children? Um. Well, I mean, 
one simple thing that helped was just coming back like several times. And, you know, as I started going to the same classrooms multiple times and they got to see me, then, you know, they would sort of be playing a, a multiple iteration game instead of like a, a single play game. So they, they had to calculate for how their behavior was going to affect our right. next interaction and our next interaction. Think more than one move um, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And then also there's, as they got to know me, you know, they right. got to like me. And so, you know, you're nicer to people you like. Yeah. <laughs> Try not to torture them then. Yeah. Um, and did you get a, did you go to graduate school for education? No. Okay. Yeah. I nope. wasn't, I wasn't just, sure. Uh, just a lot of teaching. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, that'll do it. I mean, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the necessity of the graduate school program for, for that field, but for yeah, some I'm other. Yeah, deliberately avoiding it. So. Yeah, good for you. Um, okay, so let's get into your chess background a little bit, David. So you're, sure. you've, you're from the Bay Area. How old were you when you started playing chess? I learned how to play at age five and played with my father and my brother and a family friend until about age 12 when I first found out about tournaments and chess clubs and chess books and strategy. Okay, that's the same rough story for me. Uh, we've had a string of guests who actually didn't start that young and didn't know about tournaments right away. Um, yeah. So how did you find out about them? Um, my mother saw an ad in a newspaper for a kid's chess club, which was run by the Berkeley Chess School. And uh, she knew that we really liked chess, even though, I mean, to give you a sense of how bad we were, she had once heard that there was some kind of summer chess camp kind of thing and she took us down there for a day to peek our heads in and some kids scholars made it me for the entire the entire like four hours that we were there right well the scholars made us tough if you haven't read a book or anything i mean <laughs> yeah and i uh, wouldn't stop trying to stop it you know and like i played this guy for like hours and he just scholars made it me scholars <laughs> made it me and i could not stop it yeah uh, so I, yeah so she took me to this um chess club and uh, there was a great teacher there, uh, Robert Haynes, and he immediately was like, okay, these kids have some kind of talent, and we were immediately like, okay, this guy's got some amazing wisdom to offer us, and uh, my brother and I were, were there for years thereafter. Excellent. What was his strength as a teacher? Like, what made him such a great teacher? Yeah. Um, gosh, so so many things. I mean, great teachers have so many different things but i mean i think like the most fundamental thing with every with everybody is like just treating people with a lot of like respect and attention and he he did that you know he he met us on exactly our level and respected us and gave us attention and you know that's that's a way of showing people that you really care about them and i think that 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 was the key okay um that, yeah, that's uh, that's good advice for teachers and parents alike. Um, so you you got into chess at that point and started to play tournaments, and I guess you must have risen pretty quickly. Yeah, I I played in scholastic tournaments for about a year and was twelve hundred, and then started started shooting up the next year. Um, and then it took about two years to get from. 1200 to expert i think once i was playing in adult tournaments wow and where how were you like studying non-stop or non-stop okay um what 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 was your studying approach um i would just turn on chess base and start hitting space bar on fritz no that didn't exist then. <laughs> um <laughs> you I, threw, threw me for a loop there yeah, you're like counting the years. Like, yeah, that's exactly. Just impossible. Yeah. That's impossible. I didn't have those tools. No, <laughs> right. no, we didn't have those tools. Right. Um, I read a bunch of chess books. Uh, my teacher Robert had a huge chess library, which I guess people nowadays might not prize chess libraries the same way that we did then. But back then, somebody with a big chess library it was like a real treasure trove. And so he would lend me out books and I could get more books as soon as I'd finished the books he'd given me. And I was reading a couple every week. Wow. And um, and then just playing a ton. And uh, the other component was that I had a friend, same age. I just met him at my first state championships. And we're just immediately close friends, Michael Bennett. 
and we were at similar rating, similar excitement, each of us studying chess, you know, something like 60, 70 hours a week. And um, we would just talk together about every game we played in tournaments and, wow. you know, play practice games against each other and send each other like our, we would annotate our games on paper, right? Like writing out, like we go to the quads on Saturday, then on Sunday we're at home and we're like writing out annotations to our games on paper and then like trading it with each other and putting comments on what you disagree with and the other guy's annotations. Man. And just arguing all the time about every position. Huh. That's inspiring. 60 to 70 hours a week. Um, my mind is kind of blown. Did you, uh, yeah. did you find time for school too? Or was this like a summer? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah I was at school. Okay. I was at school. But, but like but, I would study chess in class, right? Nice. You must have done that. A book under the table sort of thing? We all did that. Yeah. I mean, I was a daydreamer and I certainly thought about chess, but I don't... <laughs> I don't that think counts. I, yeah, I don't think I actually had the book under the table. Um, I was that busy. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Once you I, get to a certain level, like, and you can, like, work on some problems in your head, that totally counts, you know, yeah. and I would, like, play matches against myself in my head, so. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's and a great. Go home, and go home and write down the games. White, David. Black, David. <laughs> uh, do you still have any of the annotations? Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. You'll have to make some videos out of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> David versus David, what would it have been? Like 19, or I guess around 1995 or something? Um, yeah, something like 95, 96, you know, just beating myself in the Evans <laughs> Gambit and stuff like that. Uh huh. <laughs> that's hilarious. You, you yeah. should really do that. Um, okay, so uh, you continued to play throughout high school. So when you finished high school, um, you were probably a master by then, right? I was, yeah. And uh, and you won the Samford Fellowship somewhere around that time, correct? Or was uh, that later? Actually, actually, quite a bit later, like maybe six years later. Oh, okay. So what happened in between? Did you go to college? In between, I went to college. And in college, I tried doing the same thing I'd done in high school, of like studying chess while I was in college and playing in tournaments. Um, and it just completely didn't work out my freshman year. Um, I, I played in an I Am Norm round robin in San Francisco, and I hadn't really had many round robin tournament opportunities by that point. So I was really like excited to play in this event. But basically, I would go to class during the day, then I would do a little homework on BART, get there, play a game, like on the way home, do more homework on BART. We should let then, them. That's the Bay Area Rapid Transit, not some oh, an, yeah, not some ancient computer for, uh, for, for the youngsters <laughs> listening. But anyway, go on. Yeah, yeah. So I'd have like, you know, 40 minutes on the train back and forth, either studying for my games or doing some homework, then just up all night doing more homework and uh, studying and then repeat. And I was getting very little sleep to the point where by the end of the tournament, I fell asleep during a midterm <laughs> and fell asleep during a chess game. <laughs> right. So the, the daily at, double at that point. It was clear it wasn't working, you know. I'm like, I'm on a midterm, and there's a problem where you have to think pretty far ahead. So I thought, you know, I can think about this problem with my eyes closed just the same. No reason to stare at this paper because you're sort of looking several moves ahead like in chess. And uh, so I, like, put my head down, close my eyes. I'm thinking about it. And then suddenly there's, like, a ringing, and they're like, we will now collect your papers, you know, and I'm on, like, the <laughs> second question of the exam. That's hilarious. And are you, like, prone to falling asleep in public, or was this a, no. a one-time thing? <laughs> wow. That's no, this a, is not typical. So did you, so you scaled back the chess rather than the school? So, so the chess went. Yeah. And then it was chess only during the summer break for, for three and a half years. Okay. Uh, and what'd you, what'd you study in college? Uh, English and political economy. Okay. I was pretty similar, English and Russian. Um, nice. Um, so you can read chess books in Russian? That was the, well, the idea was to catch people cheating because, you know, I grew up in, yeah. Phil I grew up in Philadelphia. So right in the, the, um, hub of the Goitzburg, like, you know, Eastern seaboard power yeah. alley. So I would play the world open and the national chess Congress and all those events every year. And people, chess players would always be speaking Russian in the hallway. And I just, yeah. I thought they're up to no good. So, yeah, yeah. and then oh, I would totally like, by the time you're in round six or seven, like, yeah. You know, you make a move and your opponent like gets up and goes over to his friend and then they're like, Konya, 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, yeah. And you're like, what the heck is going on? And then like you hear one word you like recognize like, you know, check like check, or something like that. And you're like, I swear he's saying chess variation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of chess players have, have experienced that. And no, I'm not saying obviously that everyone was cheating, but if no, you don't understand what about, they might have been talking about some Kasparov game or something. Yeah. Yeah. They'd both read about in chess life or something. Yeah. So trust but, but verify. So I, <laughs> I decided to study yeah. Russian. Um, so, but getting back, getting back to you. So after college, you went back to chess. Yeah. Um, well, after college, uh, well, I played another summer of chess like before. Then I worked on a presidential campaign. Then um, I started a chess club and. Um, you know, spent spent a bunch of time on chess again. Okay, um, and continued to get better. And yeah, somehow continued to get a bit better. Excellent. Um, so, you played uh, chess professionally for for a few years. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I got the I got the Samford, and I had two years to travel to tournaments, pretty much you know nonstop. Um, so any uh, stand up, studying in between. Any uh, standout experiences from from that time of your life? Um. Well, I I mean, if you're not specifically just asking about like a chess game where I sacked a queen or something. No, no, no. Uh, the fewer I really, I really enjoyed the uh, visiting Turkey, okay, mm -hmm. and Norway. Nice. Um, and uh, those were really really awesome experiences the people in Istanbul were so friendly um it was just it was just awesome i was so happy there every every minute you know i i got really sick to the point where i couldn't like communicate really and some taxi driver like took me around to like see a doctor and get medicine and stuff like that i didn't even know where he was taking me or anything you know and he just like took me around and like told people what was going on i had no idea where i was or what was happening wow and this guy just like you know took care of me and took me around to everything i needed brought me back to the hotel and then the and then the staff at the hotel took care of me for several days wow that's that's incredible um so it's just yeah just just incredible and were those chess trips, Norway and Turkey, or just... yeah, those, these were all chess trips. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. That's and... that's how they're related to your question. These were all for chess trips. Um, and in Norway, you know, I'd never I'd never been up north like that before. And after playing a tournament there, I went further north and um, took a took a ferry to the Lofoten Islands, where it was just like a different world. Um, you know, just like very, very few people up there, this fishing centric um, economy or way of life. And uh, and just like landscapes like I'd never seen. Yeah, I, I haven't spent much time there. I mean, I, I've been to Stockholm and I remember flying over uh, the Nordics and just being amazed by the like sort of enchanted forest as, as, yeah. far, as far as the eye can see. Um, yeah, so those were some of the best things that uh, that stuck with me from that period. Yeah, um, and I'm sure um, the the chess itself was a great experience too. Um, the chess was fun, and the other chess players were great. I mean, I've always liked chess players, so you know, I made friends all over the place. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a small world once you once you start traveling for it. Um, so. Uh, that takes us to so Stanford was 2006, um, and uh, I believe I know since we recorded a little bit and lost the recording that you um, you <laughs> la you latched on to chess.com soon thereafter. Is that about the next major chess life event in your uh, chronology? Yeah, that was my next step from professional chess player to director of content. Okay, yeah, so. Um, I can now tell this story that David uh, met Eric and Jay, the co-founders of chess.com, along with uh, Danny Wrench at the same tournament in the Bay Area in 2009. How am I doing? December 2008. So oh, you're, only off. Oh. you're only off by about one week. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so why don't you take it from there, uh, David? Um, yeah. So as I was telling you before, the timing was really fortuitous because I was just at this point where I was 
ready to move on from being a professional chess player. Um, I'd reached a point where I felt like my focus on my own chess was really only focus on myself and not doing anything for anybody else and that I needed to be contributing in some way to other people in their lives and so on. And this is not because I think that professional chess shouldn't exist and that it doesn't contribute anything, but specifically, you know, when somebody like Carlson or or uh, Caruana or somebody, when they go and play chess tournaments, they're creating something that is enjoyed and shared by probably millions of people around the world. And uh, when I was playing in tournaments, I was not creating in that kind of way. So it was really, you know, as a 2400 player, it's really just, if you're not going to make 2700, you're really just doing it for yourself. Okay, and let's let's dig into that a little bit because I think a lot of people like I mean twenty four hundred is obviously it's amazing, uh, and for yeah. for a lot of listeners it's it's hard to comprehend the difference between say someone twenty four hundred and twenty six hundred or twenty seven. So, what what is it that felt that you felt like separated you from um, a level of I mean obviously at the very top Carlson and and Caruana, but even say top one hundred in in the world. Yeah, I mean, I barely could articulate and explain what separates me from like 2,500 rated players, you know, with whom I can compete and with whom I've talked a lot. And I've got some sense of like what skills and knowledge they have that I don't. But like, you know, 27 to 2,800, that becomes kind of unfathomable how much more skill they have than me. And I'm not even qualified to say what what their advantages are. So it's just across the board, most likely. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure. I'm right. sure they're better at every single thing and they probably they probably know more about millions of specific positions. Yeah. I don't I don't want to do. I don't want to go too deep on a nature versus nurture discussion, but I am a little yeah. a little curious. I mean, what do you like do you think they just retain things faster or process faster or is is there one standout like trait that they have? I, I don't think so because I think that I've learned that people play and learn chess in like different ways. And even if we each come up with the same like bishop takes h6 sacrifice in some position, like the method by which we each arrived at that move might be completely different. You know, some people might have calculated, some people might have just gone with their pure intuition, some people may have like logicked out how many pieces could transfer to the king side for either player. Um, even when calculating, people do it in different ways. Some people visualize a chessboard. I can't really picture a chessboard in my head. I just do it completely differently. I just keep track of where the pieces are as pieces of data, like you know, knight on f5, comma, bishop on g4. Huh. Interesting. Um. So I think everybody does it in super different ways. I think that if the top players have a unifying trait, it's probably how they react to losses. That's. That's my number one thing I look at in uh, young players in order to evaluate what their odds are of becoming really good is uh, how they react to losses. Because if you're crushed by it, that's not good. Um, And if you don't care about it, that's also not good. Well, I mean, not good from a perspective of eventually getting to 2,700. There has to be like a certain degree of being upset but super motivated to improve on it rather than discouraged. That's interesting. And where did you fall within that spectrum that you mentioned if you I lost think, a game? I think that I, I'm i I'm at a pretty good place there. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't smash my hotel rooms. Um, but I'm pretty darn upset and really motivated to study. So I think I, think I, had, a pretty, I had a pretty good learning attitude and a, and a pretty strong degree of motivation. Okay. Sounds like a recipe for success. Yeah. Um, yeah, you would think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, 24... Other things missing, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to quantify. Obviously, you're... I mean, even, like, the level from me to you, it's hard for me to quantify, but definitely, um, I do feel like my experience was people... Other people were... For one thing, they could just calculate better. And that's, you know, that's not to say that I couldn't have gotten better. But there does seem to be at least something innate in both calculation and memorizing lines, which obviously becomes more important every day uh, in chess, like it or not. 
Um, okay. Uh, moving on from this digression back to chess.com. So you started in, yeah. in uh, 2009. Um, yeah. And tell us a little bit about the early days there. Um, so chess.com was, uh, was looking to to add expert content to their site because up to that point it was a user content website like outfits like uh, YouTube were at the time. Now YouTube also has sort of you know professionally produced content right um, but the original concept was just like a platform for users to upload whatever and chess.com similarly you know 1000 rated players would be trying to learn chess from articles written by 1200 rated players or that kind of thing right mm-hmm. so um so they wanted they wanted to get professional players to work with them and professional chess players were very reticent to um sign on with uh with chess.com at first they hadn't really heard of them and um i don't <laughs> I don't know how how to put it. They they I mean a lot of them basically wouldn't give Eric or Jay the time of day. Wow. Um, and that was why they had come to my my chess tournament in December to try and like meet some professional chess players in person and see if like anyone would take them seriously. Um so what was the very initial meeting? Like how did you guys cross paths? Um they Well actually Eric had contacted me a year before to ask me uh, about uh, a job sort of like translating or porting some exercises into Chess Mentor. And that was when the site was, you know, not even a year old. Um, and at the time, I was too busy with my tournaments and I didn't have I didn't have time to, to do that, you know, specific task. So I declined it. And then a year later, he contacted me and said, hey, I saw that you're running this tournament. Can we come by and like, you know, meet some of the players? And I said, Absolutely. Uh, so that's so then you know he and Jay showed up, and uh, after the round we all went out to dinner a big group of the players along with them, and uh, you know they asked us about being professional chess players and we asked them about their website and yeah yeah and, uh, of of the big group of uh, professional chess players there it was like Danny and I who were really interested and excited about what they were doing. Okay, so yeah, this is Chess.com Vice President Danny Wrench, and I imagine a lot of listeners uh, have heard the interview that I did with Danny, but if you haven't, he goes deep into the history, so David's just going to give us a little bit of uh, his perspective. Um, so you you guys, you started to work for them after that yeah. meeting, and you were actually an employee before Danny. Yeah. Um, and Yeah, I started working for them within a month of that tournament. Um, cause as I said, like I was ready to make this change and decision and, uh, and I guess they'd probably been looking for someone to do what I did for them for a while. Um, so, and you were the content director, one of the, the first video yeah. producers, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the first products that I did as content director was, uh, videos. Okay. What else did you do? Um, articles, we got, um, I got daily columnists six days a week and seventh day, like a featured thing, featured article by different rotating different people. Um, I overhauled what was then computer workout and is now called drills, um, which was a tool where you practice a certain position against a computer. And so I, um, filled that with sort of a curriculum of, of key positions that would be good to, to be able to win consistently starting with you know basic checkmates and then advancing into like end games where you're up two pawns or end games where you're up a pawn or things like that yeah some middle games as well yeah and those were a great idea i mean it, it's the sort of thing that seems obvious in hindsight but i mean at the time there was nothing like it yeah i mean it seemed obvious to me at the time too because i'd spent so much time thinking about how to teach chess but yeah i don't think that it existed anywhere else at the time and I don't know if any other site has copied that product yet, even. Yeah, I'm not sure either. So, yeah. but but in any event, I mean, there's there's so many tools there now that are just incredible for helping people improve faster. Yeah. Um, so, how was uh, Chess.com doing as a business during your first few years there, David? 
Yeah, when I started, it was a fledgling startup with, you know, somewhere around six employees and somewhere around no revenue, maybe a tiny bit, but, um, you know, there were still, there were still startup debts that had not been paid off. And I don't think there was much revenue. I think we were just introducing the diamond membership at the time. Wow. Um, which is so basically, part, which is a key part of our business. At yes. This point. <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, I mean, during those four years, it really, it really was just growing nonstop as you, <laughs> as you suggested. Yes. Um, the number of, of members was growing rapidly. You know, we had 1 million and then 2 million and then 5 million and 10 million. And, um, so what you know, was tons of people signing up diamond memberships and so what was the work environment like was there an an office or were you guys working remotely um, um so chess.com in general has almost always had sort of a remote component like eric and jay have always been happy and willing to hire people who don't live near them and just telecommute but eric and jay were both living in the bay area as was i and the way they worked and i immediately joined was um that they worked from the loft in jay's house okay um, so they just went up there into like this little office of jay's and like they were there all day and then eric would go home to sleep and come back in the morning and actually i mean when i met them for like my interview we met had an interview and then they're like and then we just went straight to jay's house from there and i went up into that loft and started working like that minute so um so i i wow. joined them there and uh we spent a lot of happy times up in that up in that office if you look up super old chess.com videos or or tv broadcasts they were done up there that's incredible i, I mean uh, yeah that really brings it home to just picture a couple guys in a loft and now it's just it's it's such a big presence in the chess world yeah but still completely you know diffuse like a, a an online office not an in-person office yeah lots of employees but no big no big building yeah no, no campus <laughs> so david you were at chess.com for a few years but then it's been documented on the internet and i think some of the things written might might even be true about what happened so you ended up leaving chess.com uh for a while what what happened when you left uh the company yeah, so I, I I left after just about just over four years um, because of a difference in opinion about how to compensate um, our newer employees who who you know hadn't been on since since early on and didn't have stock in the company and so forth and um, you know I I just couldn't convince Eric and Jay of my opinion at the time and they couldn't convince me of their opinion at the time. And, you know, it was just such a, such a major issue for each of us and we couldn't agree. So I, I left. Wow. And, um, must've been a, an emotionally fraught time, I imagine, because I, I mean, you said you were working 60 to 70 hours a week and you guys were, were friends too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was super, it was super emotional. You know, I really, I really thought I could convince them. They probably really thought they could convince me. Um, you know, you can be really good friends with people and not necessarily judge everything about each other accurately or, you know, or have things that you just strongly disagree about and you don't realize it or you don't talk about it or it doesn't matter day to day. But then, um, when you're business, it might together, it, it might suddenly become important. Right. And obviously you guys, I'm sure each had an emotional connection to the site. So that, that yeah, was... I mean, the site is kind of like. You know, I think I think I speak for at, for all of us really in saying that the site kind of feels like your kid, but like right. you know, like there's like 50 parents or whatever. But um, but you know, obviously someone like Eric or Jay who co-founded the site even more so because they've put in more hours than anybody else and they've spent more time thinking about it than anybody else, et cetera. You know, and I was there, you know, since a pretty early point and worked on it really, really hard. Um, you know, I had a similar work attitude as them, just, you know, 
sleeping next to my computer with the sound on really loud so that every time something happened on chess.com an email came in or anything i could like pop up you know because wow. we're working with people around the around the world right yeah once i came in i was hiring you know chess teachers ims gms from around the world that i knew from my tournaments and just like responding instantly to everything um so you know you put that kind of thing in and and i think i think more you know even more than other people um eric and jay and i really felt like oh my gosh like i i can't be separated from chess.com this is my thing you know not my thing to the exclusion of it also being other people's things but right and i know danny feels that way as well yeah yeah that must have been must have been hard so um, it was tough and, and we really enjoyed what we were doing you know and we were on the same page you know with a lot of like design questions and product questions and strategy questions so i mean we we obviously worked really well together um for a long time and 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 do again now yeah and i i've seen it mentioned online that this was sort of I mean, it almost was a political philosophy question. Um, yeah. Uh, so what what was your governing political philosophy? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely against capitalism. Um, I think it's a bad system that turns everything to garbage, basically. It ruins anything it touches. Um, uh, like our planet, for example. But, but um, right. you know, so kind of... Kind of uh, I guess kind of some brand of communist, not that I would say that I specifically know exactly how society should be arranged, only that it's really obviously arranged wrongly right now. Um, and I do agree in general with the ideas that, you know, the people who put in the work should all own part of the work they do. So, um, you know, that was a different uh, perspective. Right. Um, so you don't, I mean, uh, We'll try to limit the the politics discussion to to not too long, but I am just curious. Yeah. So you don't have an an overarching view of like how governments should function and like capital should be I, allocated. I have a ton of ideas. I have a ton <laughs> of ideas about it. I just, I just, I don't, I don't have the knowledge, and I don't think the data is out there for anyone to claim they have the knowledge to say exactly how the world should how society should best be organized you know i've got a bunch of ideas of things we could try and then you would have to gather data about how it worked or didn't work right and right. then incorporate that data in revisions of your system right um but i certainly believe in like you know communal public ownership of you know major resources like land air water um and other means of means of production right okay um yeah i'm sure not not everyone listening will agree i'm personally not i'm not too far from you <laughs> but, uh, okay. but but i mean in any event it's germane to the discussion of chess.com because obviously yeah. like that makes it um you know a tough baby to split if yeah. if you guys just have are coming from totally different angles about like how companies should be um how companies should uh be arranged um, yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of people thought when I published my 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 blog post finally about why I'd left. A lot of people thought that it was a personal attack on like Eric or Jay saying like you know this person is specifically like greedy and terrible. But the the real thing I was trying to make was a political comment. I was trying to talk about it very generally and with you know no specific examples or very few specific examples about Chess dot com or or anybody who worked there but that you know for example we believe in a democracy in a democratic way of like organizing social life but then corporations are basically very hierarchical kind of structured like a dictatorship not like a democracy right right so i was trying to make that point like maybe decision making should be spread out a little bit within a corporation instead of being sort of a dictatorial structure and you know similarly that profits should perhaps be divided out a little bit more equally rather than being concentrated among the same people who are the decision makers and you know this is like a i was trying to make a structural argument let's right. put it that way not a personal argument right which is obviously easier to do since th this blog post that you mentioned came out much later as you said right after the I, dust had settled yeah, it was it was published about seven or eight months later um after i'd had a lot of time 
as you said, it was like emotional. I was really upset yeah, of about course. leaving chess.com. So I waited a long time to write it to make sure that I was writing a structural, philosophical, political post, not like a, I wanted this and he wanted that right. and now I don't have my candy. You yeah. Know, kinda, kind yeah. of emotional thing. Right. Um, and luckily for the listeners, this story has a bit of a happy ending. So you, you are back at chess.com now. Yeah. Um, as of January 2016, I started recording stuff again for chess.com. Um, because in December they had um, instituted something which Eric and I had already been discussing f- again for a bit, um, but they'd instituted a profit share that was more than what I had asked for um, in 2013 before leaving. Dare I ask if you feel like vindicated in any way or is it not? Um, I mean, I feel like ecstatic, happy about that. Um. You know, I don't. I don't have this like huge like desire to be right about things, and I think to be like a good chess player, you have to be like that. You you have to be like interested in finding out what the best ideas are, not in like trying to have your ideas be best. Right. Now, for, now to find out what the best ideas are, you need to argue like as well as you can for your ideas. That's the only way to truly test them, and you need other people who argue for their ideas, right? So you need to say like this outpost on d5 outweighs the bishop pair. And you need to like put everything you have into proving that, and then the person you're working with needs to put everything they have into their opposing viewpoint that the bishop pair is going to outweigh the outpost on d5. Which it does, by the way. Oh, does it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking Sveshnikov, but um, <laughs> but um, but my point is like you need to really argue your opponent, your your position fiercely if you want to get to the best idea. But ultimately, you can't have a stake in what idea is going to turn out to be the right idea because otherwise you can't properly evaluate as you learn what the right idea is right so yeah in uh the trading business they say you should you should have strong opinions weekly held yeah i've heard that (laughs) so it's exactly like that you know like i need to fiercely argue my opinions but i'm not set on having my opinions be right or wrong okay well i mean uh it sounds great i mean the you know profit sharing is not communism per se and uh, i mean (laughs) but it's a great step towards it (laughs) um yeah i don't know exactly where i come down on that like i said definitely sympathetic to your view but it certainly gets complicated when corporations are involved um but i'm yeah human society is complicated i mean an individual person is complicated right so now a million people milling about with intersecting interests yeah but certainly with you on, on broad the broad question of government allocation of resources, I think we're not not terribly far apart. Um, so so now you're back at chess.com. You're making videos. You're you're yeah. going to be teaching full time next year. Um, you're married, right? Yeah. Do you have any kids? Yes. How how I have one. oh nice how how old? Uh, two and a half. How how are you liking parenting? I love it right now. Yeah. The first the first uh 8 months were difficult for me and then it just became increasingly awesome and entertaining from there. Yeah. I I can relate although my my youngest it was more than the first 8 months, probably the first 14, but Yeah. But, but I'm no. I'm sure it's different for yeah. based on the kids and the parents. But. Yeah, that's a good point. Um so you think you'll you'll have any more, dare I ask? Yeah. Nice. I'd like to. Excellent. And uh yeah. And even though it's even though it's costing me all my chess tournaments, that's, <laughs> that's the answer to the question about why I'm not playing in chess tournaments. Yeah, exactly. I'm with you. I can, you know, sometimes I'm doing tasks like with my kids, and maybe I can do some tactics on the phone. Although maybe I shouldn't be doing that as a parent. But yeah. But, but either way, that's as far as my chess study can basically go. <laughs> okay. Um, I still I still find time for a lot of chess study actually, like at night when she's asleep, or you know during a nap, or here or there um but a tournament i can't do because i'm you know i'm on the i I can't get away from her for that many hours right i'm on the hook to take care of her so yeah i was never a good like game 30 or game 45 player but now that's like the only thing i can consider that's what you have to do yeah yeah um so when you so when you study what kind of uh what kind of um what do you do do you still read books i play through all the games from 
like the top tournaments. Okay. And, you know, any other GM tournaments that are well presented and like easy to find the games and look through. And um, and I do tactics and I analyze games sometimes. Like, so I've been able to play one game, one tournament this year and one tournament last year. So that gave me, you know, six games each year to to analyze my own games. So do you really, do you spend like multiple sessions going through those games? I have to because my time is like in 15 minute chunks right. oh, sometimes. Okay. Uh, sometimes an hour, but certainly not enough to like do like a full game analysis, which is like, you know, 20 hours or something. Right. Wow. 20 hours. No, no wonder you're stronger than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have doing all this chess work on the side? Uh, do you have any ambitions of, um, of like uh, playing again someday? I would love to be playing. I'm like, I'm thinking about it very frequently when I'm studying. I wish I could play in a tournament. The one time a year that I I arrange for other people to take care of my daughter for a whole weekend and I play a, a tournament. You know, after that, I'm just like, oh, I can't wait till the next one a year from today. Wow. Um, and also, you know, when I'm broadcasting and watching all these like chess games, um, it's all super inspiring. Anytime I'm in touch with chess, it kind of makes me want to play as well. Yeah, I mean, and you were you broadcasted for the Pro Chess League. I really, I really enjoyed your coverage on that. I'm sure. Glad I think, to hear it. I think something about about that in particular. Um, I don't know. It, it makes me want to play more than other events. Cool. Um, Good to hear. But does it does I, it I have don't that know exactly why? Does it have that effect on you? Um. No, I think it's pretty much equal. Like anytime I'm thinking about chess. It kind of makes me want to go play in a tournament. Okay, because for me, <laughs> whether, I'm, whether I'm broadcasting, you know, Wesley So versus <laughs> right, you know, Caruana or something, or whether I'm broadcasting like two six year old kids playing each other. Nice. Well, that that's great. I mean, that's why you were able to to put in all those hours um, over the years. Yeah. Um, I think the reason it, it that makes me want to play more than other things is just the novelty. It feels new and energetic. Uh, more so than like I mean I love these elite tournaments but the guys play each other so often you know mm -hmm. um, that's true and the the opening stuff like you know if I watch someone like Peter Fiddler explain it it makes sense to me but otherwise it's it, it's still it's just over my head for the most part unless it happens to be one of the like three openings I have some depth about yeah actually i think that you've brought up something important one of the few things that's more inspiring than other things because i said everything was equal but now that i'm thinking um when i learn a new chess idea mm -hmm. that's particularly inspiring so you know if i if i happen to catch you know peter spidler commenting on something um you know or if uh if you know one of my gm friends like explains some game to me or some opening idea or something, then I'm like, oh, new idea. And yeah. that, that gets me going more than anything. Um, so actually having not played for a while and gotten weaker and forgotten a lot of stuff, it's now much easier for me to learn new stuff again. Right. Um, and so that's part of why I get super excited when I go play in this one tournament, you know, because it's like I'm rediscovering you know, I go into the tournament and on the first day, it's like I'm 2000 instead of 2400. Right. And then I'm like rediscovering like, oh, yeah, I can do this or I can, you know, calculate. Wow, I saw a detail, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, it gets it gets super exciting to go from like 2000 to 2400 in a week or <laughs> in a weekend. Uh, if only it were so easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so, David, I only have a couple more questions for you, but I, I did... I, I haven't kept up with your whole library on chess.com, but I did watch a little bit of your tactics series. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought you had uh, an interesting insight into a way to approach tactics puzzles that mm -hmm. that um, I hadn't really heard anywhere else. So um, I don't know to what extent you remember part one of your four-part series, but do you mind talking about your overall uh, philosophy and, and how to approach uh, studying tactics? Well, as you know, I actually recorded these videos a year <laughs> right. ago. Yes. Um, but uh, I do remember it. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, I've had to rewatch it a few times in order to a answer people's specific questions because they're like, you know, at minute thirteen seventeen, right. why did you say this? And you know, what do you think about blah blah blah? And sometimes they don't give a timestamp, and I have to rewatch the whole video to answer their question. Um, 
But uh, what what you're referring to is the idea that you need to know a certain number of like basic patterns, and that you know if somebody's not going to reinvent Philidor's checkmate without ever having been been shown it. You know the queen g8 check, rook takes queen, knight f7, smothered mate. Right? Like right. you could stare at that position for 20 minutes as a new player, and if you've never heard of that pattern, you're not going to find a checkmate in two that only has one branch. Right? Like it's not like there's six different defenses to calculate or anything right right you just simply won't see it if you don't know this pattern and there's a lot a lot a lot of chess patterns like that which i think you basically just have to have like seen them at some point so if you just sit there trying to solve puzzles if you're like a new player and you're just sitting there trying to solve tactical puzzles you simply like can't solve them right like calculation is actually not the kind of brute force calculation of every legal move that computers do um or or did at first before pruning um right but calculation is actually like putting together different patterns that you already know and testing whether they work in a slightly different position, right? Or how different details affect them. Or if there's any surprising, you know, move at the end or in the middle of a set pattern that you know. So basically, you need to learn all these patterns. You just need to see them. And that means that as a beginner, when you're solving puzzles, you should basically be looking up the answers instead of trying to rack your brain to solve something you can't solve look at it quickly and uh if you can solve it within 30 seconds probably you already knew that pattern then move on and any problem that stumps you for more than like 30 seconds or a minute um you probably just don't know that pattern you need to just look at the answer then review the answer a bunch of times and uh the the guideline i give is to like play through the answer three times and then try and visualize the answer three times in your head so a total of six repetitions and then hopefully you've stored that away. And, uh, you know, your goal would be to learn two or three new patterns a day for two or three years. And then you'll have the store of basic patterns that you need yeah, to I th- become a good tactician. Yeah, I think it's it's great advice. Uh, I I hadn't really thought about it that way. I sort of, without thinking it through from a, a you know, um, pedagogy perspective, I just felt like if you... If you do the tactics, then by osmosis, eventually you learn the patterns. But mm-hmm. <laughs> but what you suggested yeah. to me, I, I mean, it makes sense. It, it seems like a, a better system. To yeah, add, it's just how fast it. or how slow do you do it, right? Because you've right. got limited time and you're also, you know, you need to get, get in some time playing and, you know, looking over your games at some point and maybe reading a book. So, you know, if you obstinately try and find the answer to every tactic for 30 minutes before you then just give up and look at the answer anyway. It's going to take you an hour and a half to learn three new patterns, whereas, you know, I I and my students can do it in like, well, now I know the patterns, but, you know, my students can do it in like 15 minutes daily. They can learn their three new patterns and they're done. So so do you think that advice still applies to like a master level player who's still trying to improve a tactics? No, because a master level player will know all, you know, will know like the couple thousand basic building blocks they need to know. So their tactical ability would be based on more advanced things like calculation, visualization, um, you know, stretching their mind to see unusual moves, uh, maybe like alertness, knowing when to look for tactics and when not to look for tactics in their own games. Um, Because, you know, in in general, when you miss a tactic for your opponent, it's usually a tactic that, or very often a tactic that you could have calculated, but you weren't looking for it, right? Right, yeah. So that... You might think like, oh, this guy's got this kind of tactical weakness that he keeps letting people like play forced wins against him. But, um, you know, maybe it's not because he can't calculate them. Maybe it's because he doesn't look for them at the right time. So right. there, what you need to work on is the sense of danger. Yeah. Uh, how how so, would you work on a sense of danger? Just game analysis? Um, with the exercise in the second video of, okay. the, of my tactics. Yeah, I did. Yeah, series. I did watch the second video. Yeah, um, creating sort of an alert system for yourself by right. s- by keeping track of how many pieces are in bad shape tactically, whether it be hanging or on the same line as the opponent's bishop or queen, or whether it be unable to move, or whether it be you know defending two different things, etc. Um, keeping track of all of that and eventually making it a subconscious process. Okay. Well, for people who want to see David go even deeper, I definitely recommend these videos on chess.com. Yeah, um, it's just the 10-second version of a 10-minute right. video. 
Yeah, and I'm sure you've got more in the pipeline that uh, that that I can ask you about some other day. Um, before I let you go, David, do you have any uh, standout chess book recommendations from all that that reading you did in your uh, teenage years? Uh, yes, lots of them. <laughs> There's so many good books. Uh, basically, I go by author. If somebody writes a good book, probably all their books are good. So, um, Lev Polugayevsky, um, Yasser Sirawan. Basically, I'm just going to give you author names, and you can read anything by these people. Yasser Sirawan, um, Gary Kasparov. I've heard uh, of him. Yeah, really, really good chess author. Yeah. <laughs> um, I liked Alyekin, Bronstein, um, Fisher, Botvinnik. Well, with Fisher, I'm going to say specifically my 60 memorable memorable games more than Bobby Fisher teaches chess. <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> <laughs> the most sold chess book at some point, I think. Yeah, but, um, I, I've got my copy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, David, is there is there anything else you, you want to say before I, I uh, let you get on with your life? Yeah, the one thing that I that I would like to uh, tell everybody about is chess broadcasting. Um, I think that turning chess into like an exciting thing that you can watch on your on your internet TV is uh, super super fun. That's what I'm that's what I'm most like excited about right now. Trying to come up with different chess television type shows, you know, like the Speed Chess Championships or the Pro Chess League, um, and I'm really looking to up my game as a commentator. And, um, you know, if anybody has ideas of, like, good chess shows or if anybody wants to try them, try their hand at being a chess broadcaster, um, I'd love to talk to anybody about that topic and, uh, you know, see if they have any any useful input. Excellent. You may you may regret putting this out there, David. <laughs> but uh, yeah. hopefully, I, I mean, I know we've got a strong chess players that listen and chess enthusiasts, so I think people will have good suggestions and uh, maybe some uh, some talents will reach out to you. Um, how how should they reach you? Um, my handle is dpruce on chess dot com. That's also my at chess dot com email address, and I think that's my Twitter as well. Probably oh. also deep Bruce. Okay, uh, I mean if yeah, I'll I'll send a link to your Twitter handle. Yeah. I'll, I'll include it in the, so the title. Should be pretty easy to find me. You can send me a message on chess. dot com or an email or a tweet. Excellent. Um, well, David, thanks again for doing this. Sorry about the the technical difficulties. I'm on a bit of um I'm on a bit of a down streak here. <laughs> I've had uh, <laughs> uh, after no technical difficulties for like 22 interviews. I've had like mm-hmm. two out of three, and so I appreciate your patience. Um, and and I really enjoyed the interview. No problem. I I'm glad to hear that. And thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. To hear more episodes, give feedback, or suggest guests, go to perpetualchesspod.com. If you like the show, please help me out by telling your friends and giving me a high rating on iTunes. I'll be back next week with another episode of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess.